We are recording. Yes, sir. <clears throat> Thank you. I'll call the meeting to order at uh, 9.30. Uh, and I'll begin with uh, this uh, announcement. This, uh, this council meeting, uh, this council meeting is being held, being held by electronic participation pursuant to the municipality's procedural bylaw number 2020-020 as amended and section 238 part 3.1 of the municipal act 2001 as amended. The meeting will be live streamed on the municipality's YouTube channel. The video recording will be uploaded to municipalities, municipality of Trent Hills website following the meeting. Um, so we are now in session and I would uh, be resolved that the agenda for the council meeting of September the 15th, 2020 be received and adopted. Could I get a mover and seconder, please? No. So move. Uh, Rose and uh, Mike, uh, all in favor? Uh, I guess you call the vote. Sorry, Doug. Deputy Mayor Kelleher McLennan? Yes. Councillor Metcalf? Yes. Councillor Redden? Yes. Councillor Tully? Yes. Councillor Bratney? Yes. Mayor Crate? Yes. Carried by six, Your Worship. Thank you. Uh, is there any disclosure of a pecuniary interest or the nature thereof? I have nothing recorded, seeing none, hearing none. Uh, <clears throat> we'll have the minutes of the, the, the uh, council meeting held September the 1st. Be resolved that the minutes of the council meeting held September the 1st, 2020 be received and adopted as presented or amended. Could I get a mover and seconder for that, please? So moved. So I'll second. Kathy and seconded by Jean. Uh, any discussion? Call the vote, please, Doug. Councillor Redden? Yes. Councillor Kelly? Yes. Councillor Bradney? <laughs> yes. Deputy Mayor Kelleher McLennan? Yes. Councillor Metcalf? Yes. Mayor Crate? Yes. Carried by six, Your Worship. Thank you. <clears throat> Should announce that uh, Councillor uh, English is not with us today. He wasn't able to attend this meeting. And um, also, I'd like to say uh, I know Sue Dickens has joined us, and I want to thank her for all she does to uh, keep the municipality informed on, on our, our doings. Uh, we have no public hearings and no deputations. Um, we have uh, Jack Amelodolia uh, and Dr. Robert Williams uh, with us regarding the uh, Ward Boundary and Council Composition Review final report. Um, so I'll turn it over to those gentlemen and Doug, you're looking after the slides. Yeah, so as soon as they tell me, I will share the screen with the PowerPoint presentation for today's uh, session. Sure, you could you can go ahead and share it, Doug. Uh, so good morning to everybody. It's nice to uh, virtually see everybody today. Um, Dr. Williams and I have often talked over the last several months that our last actual in-person meeting for ward boundary reviews were with you folks on March 17th when we heard about the uh, emergency order. So. Definitely some different times since then. Um, so the purpose of, uh, of speaking to you today, the reason Dr. Williams and I are, are here today is to let council know that we've uh, reached or pretty much reached the end of the ward boundary review process, at least in terms of uh, the analysis, uh, the public engagement process, the feedback that we've heard, uh, the reports are, are largely done. Um, and we've, uh, we've gotten to the point where we're able to present to council today uh, two final recommended options uh, through the analysis that we've completed. Um, so Dr. Williams is gonna speak to you about those options, but before we uh, get there, I just quickly wanna go through a, a summary of the project, um, highlight the process again for council, um, remind uh, uh, who we spoke to and, and the public engagement process. And then, like I said, we'll get into the uh, actual uh, options. Um, so if you recall, uh, it's, it was almost a year, uh, this study in the making. Obviously a little bit delayed uh, based on the original plan because of the, the COVID uh, uh, issue that happened a few months ago. So that delayed things a little bit, but it was about a year in the making. 
Um, and as we mentioned, I'm, I'm Jack Amendolia from Watson, and we worked in conjunction with Dr. Robert Williams uh, to complete this project. Uh, the project started with uh, a big research information gathering phase. Um, if council recalls, uh, way back in the winter, I think in January or, or earlier or in the fall of last year, uh, Dr. Williams and myself conducted interviews with council. We spoke to staff. Um, really, the intention of that was a couple of things. We wanted to evaluate the current council composition, the current ward boundary system, um, and provide some uh, uh, um, uh, evaluation of what was going on currently. Um, as a result of that work, we also released two surveys to the public to try to find out um, what the issues were with the public and what their thoughts were on this. Um, we had a total of three public information sessions. Um, one was a live session back in January of 2020, um, dealing more with council composition. And then during uh, the COVID measure measures, we had two virtual sessions. So on the same day, we had two separate sessions one in the afternoon, one in the evening, to try to encompass different schedules, hopefully to reach as many people as we could. Um, we also had a dedicated web page, or the municipality had a dedicated web page throughout the process with different informational resources for the community to uh, look at. And this is the second council meeting that, that we've now had. If we move to the next slide. Uh, so just a reminder again, this was a two-phase study. So the first phase was really dedicated and focused on council composition. And we looked at a few things, number of councils, so council size, the number of wards within the municipality, uh, whether or not the deputy mayor should be an elected position, um, and then the number of councillors per ward. So that was really the first phase of the study and council then gave us directions to go into the ward boundary review portion of the study. So again, as I mentioned a couple of minutes ago, if we move to the next slide, uh, one of our last meetings was uh, March 17th, 2020. And at that meeting, that was the conclusion of phase one. And council at that meeting approved five resolutions. So again, starting with the municipal election in 2022, council has continued to elect councillors in award system. So that was the first resolution that we basically posed the question, should we continue award system or go at large? Decision was made to continue with the award system. The size of council was seven and council has elected to continue with seven member council. So that remains the same. The deputy mayor position has now been uh, decided to be elected at large. So the deputy mayor position was selected by council or is selected by council currently, starting with the 2022 election, the deputy mayor would be elected at large. Uh, right now, uh, the number, each ward has a different number of councillors. Um, starting again in 2022, council has elected to have one ward per, uh, one councillor per ward. And then ward boundary options will be based on a five ward system. So that was basically our marching orders um, after March 17th was go ahead, uh, do a ward boundary review, look at possible boundary reconfigurations, but these are the five resolutions that that review is going to be based on. So I'm gonna pass it over now, if we move to the next slide, to Dr. Williams, and he can take you through uh, what we considered in terms of preliminary options, and then the actual two final options that will be presented to council today. Thank you. Thank you, Jack. Um, we, uh, as, as Jack said, we had certain directions to follow, and, and those were, set out for us at the outset of the uh, the review. The uh, consideration for ward boundaries uh, is not one that, that's driven by single factor, but by a combination of things. And uh, our challenge was to try to develop a five ward, five ward system for Trent Hills based on the, the, consider, the factors that are, that are noted here on the slide. Looking at uh, population and the present population and future population. This is the uh, resource that Watson and Associates bring to the table. That's uh, uh, the area of expertise that uh, they contribute uh, primarily to these kinds of studies. And, and we, we are fairly confident that that's a, a solid basis to build on. We're also looking at the historical nature of the communities. And again, this is a perspective that was we were asked to address, but became very clear, not only in the discussions with members of council, 
but with the community that there are distinctive and long-term communities, uh, settlement areas that uh, need to be recognized in the development of wards uh, in Trent Hills. Another, another very important factor is the topography and geography of the area. Uh, and, and that should be no surprise that, that uh, Trent Hills is, is uh, uh, influenced a lot of, in a lot of ways by uh, river courses, by extensive geography, by areas that are uh, in proximity and others that are not. Uh, it's it's a, an area that uh, is not a, a neat grid, if you will, uh, that, that could, could be used in wards. And we need to be aware of how those areas uh, relate to one another and, and uh, how people get around uh, the municipality. And then uh, we do have uh, this component of community feedback and engagement. Some of that came in the form of written responses, but other parts came uh, through our ac interaction with the community back in Hastings in January and in our, our two virtual sessions, we had uh, comments, questions, uh, viewpoints that were put to us that we wanted to keep in mind as we moved forward. Now, as uh, suggested uh, in our um, last round of consultations in July, we had four options that we put out there. That's not to say that those were the only ones uh, that we drew up. Uh, uh, Jack and I and, and other associates at Watson's worked together to, to try different ways of coming up uh, with wards that would work for Trent Hills. Uh, some of them for various reasons were simply not going to be uh, uh, acceptable because of, for example, population uh, distribution, various things of that sort and other factors. Anyway, we came up with four we took those out to the community, had these consultations, and, and we gathered a little bit of feedback, not as much as we would like, and that's a bit surprising, but uh, normally people get very excited with the maps and like to do things. So uh, we didn't get as much feedback as we would like. However, it was fairly clear that out of the four options that we put together, two of them uh, were the ones that it, that attracted support for different reasons. And that's wh why we have uh, uh, two recommended options for a moment. So these were, were drawn up with an eye toward the guiding principles that I mentioned uh, earlier that were part of the original study. We'll go on to the next slide then. So as I said, there were four options, uh, preliminary options, that's our, our standard approach. Here are some ideas. Let's see what people think. Uh, and one of those that was originally uh, uh, preliminary option A uh, was one that, that many people found uh, appealing uh, for reasons that, that uh, we can talk about. So what we recommend here as, as option number one is one that is built around uh, preserving communities of interest. And uh, in, in, in this exercise, two of those settlement areas, the two uh, to the west side, are fairly simple. They're not likely going to be divided up. We would want to build them around surrounding areas. The real question is what to do with, with Campbellford in that whole picture. Uh, and in this option, we, we developed one that made, uh, made that the basis of a single ward. A more compact urban ward, recognizing that it is the largest center, uh, the, the, the largest population cluster, and in many ways, because of that uh, uh, distribution of population, different than much of the rest of Trent Hill. So this is a system that says, let's create a ward based on community. We work from that that point uh, around Campbellford, a little bit of uh, area around it, but not a lot and basically uh, use that as one of the wards and then design uh, others uh, to go around that. And as you'll see on the, uh, on the screen there and in the report, the one complication for, that, for doing things that way is that the population of, of that, uh, what would become uh, Ward 3 is, is a little bit on the high side, not, not really difficult in the short term uh, within a, a range of acceptable variation. By uh, 2030, 
it nudges above that that uh, informal variation that we were looking at, which was roughly 25%. And 25% is not carved in stone, if I can put it that way. It's a, it's a rule of thumb that we try to work with. This falls slightly outside of that, but again, has the advantage of creating a single uh, focused ward uh, around, uh, uh, around Campbellford. Can we have the next slide, please? The second option, and it's nice to see that transition so easily, we, we aim toward population parity, a greater balance of population. And, and as um, I think we, we made this comment when we were having our, our consultations in, um, in July, this is a remarkable uh, outcome. If the goal is, is getting toward wards that are all within a very close range of, of what we call the optimal size, uh, this is almost unheard of, if I can put it that way, especially uh, with the kind of distribution of population that we find in Trent Hills. We got five wards that are all very, very close to what we call optimal, not just in the present time, but in that projected population pattern. So for those who believe that, that the goal should be having wards of, of as close to, to parity as possible, as close to population balance as possible, option two, which was preliminary option B, uh, is, is really quite amazing. Uh, that it really does that uh, in a way that, that's very, very difficult to achieve in most cases. And this one is very strong in that regard. So those are the two basic scenarios that we look at. One, keep the, and, and of course you notice the trade-off here is to get to that population, uh, Campbellford is treated in a, a slightly different way than in the, the previous um, scenario. Uh, and we add a, a some rural area to it. But as I said, we ended up with this great uh, population uh, uh, balance being achieved. So as I said, trade-offs uh, in the two scenarios. So the next slide, please, um, uh, is, is laying those out in comparative forms uh, and, and each with their strengths. And you'll see the, the, um, the balance is, is really pretty uh, amazing, uh, especially as I said on the option two with population but certainly the other is not uh, terribly uh, uh, far behind it in, in the overall picture, but is very strong in representing community of interest. Um, so those are the two uh, options. We make it very clear in the report uh, that either one of those would be a defensible scenario in our view for Trent Hills going forward. Uh, it's not that one is right and the other is wrong. Both of them uh, are, are acceptable. It's a matter of which, is, which priority council believes should be uh, uh, emphasized in selecting one option or the other. So uh, we've just the last slide is basically saying uh, where we are, we've, we've done the, the, uh, the phase one as Jack walked through before. This, this uh, led us to the decision uh, at, at, our, uh, at the March 17th meeting uh, to, to go ahead with these five decisions. Phase two then, we went back through uh, the information we had working with what we heard from you and what we heard from the community through the, the survey, developed those options, did the consultation in an unusual fashion, of course, uh, now becoming routine uh, to do it this way, but, but that was an experiment which I think was, was uh, appropriate. Uh, and we came to these final uh, recommendations. Uh, and and our, our goal today uh, is to help you make a choice uh, through the two options. And then once you have made that choice, the clerk will, uh, and we would work with the clerk on that to develop the formal bylaws, two of them. Uh, one, to approve the change in the composition of your council uh, to adopt the, the uh, election process for the deputy mayor and the second bylaw to implement these particular boundaries for use in the next election. So uh, today it, it's a matter of, of uh, indicating which of these two options you wish to move with. And then the tidy up, if you will, will come uh, soon after with, with the formal bylaws. 
So that's where we are now. And I think uh, we can turn it back to council for any questions or comments. Well, uh, thank you, uh, Jack and, and Dr. Williams. Um, I think a, a, a great report, and uh, I will now open it up to council for uh, any questions. <clears throat> well, <laughs> seems that it was an excellent report because <laughs> you answered all the questions. Um, Mike? Leave it to Mike. Um, I, 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 it's more of a question as to what's the recommended uh, amount of time to pass before we look at doing another review? Uh, there's no requirement. Sorry, Mr. Mayor, I'll just jump in if you don't mind. Uh, there's no formal requirement to review these boundaries at all in the legislation. It's one of the reasons why it lasted as long as it did. We used the, the timeline of three elections uh, as a way to, to give us some, some structure so you don't have to visit this each time out. I, I would say that, that at that point, sorry, two things. If you find that after the next, say after the second election, and the clerk would be doing a report back to council about the election, if you suddenly find that that these projections have have changed through some other factor, and the and the balance that you achieve is wildly exaggerated, or somehow something has changed, certainly you're welcome to go back in and do it sooner. I think that the, the sense we try to get at is that after three elections, it's time to step back and just say, does it still fit? And I think the, the rule of thumb to me would be uh, that at the federal level, and it impacts you at the provincial level, this happens after every census. Now you don't follow that cycle here necessarily, but you'd step back and say, does it still work? Just as you do with virtually every part of your municipal operation. You don't simply say, well, <clears throat> you know, what we arranged to do in 2020 will allow to, to, to stay untouched for 30 years. You, you would probably have an informal incentive to go back and look at it just to make sure that, that there haven't been a, a unanticipated changes. Or even just to say, are we still happy with the way things are? So again, that's, that's an informal decision on the part of council. I would just add to that, or if someone formally petitions um, the municipality, then you have to do a review. Um, so that's the only other sort of complicating factor there. Great, thank you. Anyone else wish to, uh, uh, Rose? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, well, first off, I want to say a great work, and I, and I think what we've come up with, with what you've come up with, um, are probably the two of the best solutions that we could possibly look at. Um, I'm definitely leaning in favor of keeping the town of Campbellford as a whole. We've faced our challenges over the years after amalgamation um, with the town of Campbellford with the bridge issue, a number of things that have come up that have divided our community. And I do not want to see that again, whether that's a, a, a river issue, whether it's a bridge issue, whether it's a population issue. I personally don't feel that the, the population base of Campbellford is that onerous um, that a councillor, a deputy mayor, a mayor couldn't, couldn't look after. Right now, we're all helping each other. And I, and I know that all the people who are on council right now have answered the call to numerous constituents from all over the municipality. So I, I don't feel that because one ward has a few more population base than another, that that's a reason to, to split the town of Campbellford. We, we've had to heal a number of wounds and I do not want to tear those bandages off again. Um, the, um, the, um, the, the review itself, I, I feel, was, was good, and uh, it brought a lot of uh, stuff to the surface that I think we did need to address. It's interesting for me because in 2004 and 2005, I pushed the mayor of the day at that time to look at changing the way we did our election and look at electing the deputy mayor at large, and I got constant pushback, absolutely no way. 
So now we're back full cycle to where we now will be uh, electing the deputy mayor at large. And I do feel that that's the right thing to do. Um, so other than that, I think that um, the rest of the, uh, the way the rest of the, the wards would be laid out, I think is good. And I still believe that it doesn't matter if somebody calls me from, from ward two, three, four, or five, and they can't reach somebody else uh, I would definitely say, sure, I'll, I'll come. I'll see what's wrong. What can I help you with? And I know the rest of council would do the same. So those are my comments. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thanks, Rose. Uh, Kathy? Okay, thank you. Um, I wish we'd had you around in 98. It might have made us uh, a little more, well, it would have made things uh, slightly different now, but uh, I'm glad we're doing it now. And uh, I, I agree with your comments that there at times there is a natural time when it should happen if somebody brings it forward but i would think within another 10 years we would definitely want to revisit this and i think some of that is what mike is getting at or at least i'm going to jump on what mike said um, if we do make a decision today that perhaps is a little skewed in terms of population um, who would have believed the number of houses that came to hastings um, in the last term um, and how many more could come there Hastings may end up by virtue of growth in Peterborough or non-growth uh, to be the population center for housing and so on. And uh, Workwith could very well be behind in, or shortly behind them. So um, I think for me, there are two ways of making decisions. There are those ones that seem to fall into place and seem very natural. And I think you've kind of identified it by, by looking at how easily the three more urban centers seem to be uh, um, connected to some rural areas and how that fit. Um, unfortunately, where Campbellford is geographically, it makes it a little more difficult because we certainly don't want to see the Seymour areas, particularly in the Northeast, feel that they're kind of out of place or they're way off in the corner. And um, as a community, we felt that way through some of our county um, uh, uh, involvement and we certainly don't want to make parts of Seymour feel that way as well. Um, and that's partly why I have some difficulties with with option two, just just the way it kind of looks. Um, but uh, I, we also have to pay attention to the formulas. Um, and I think you've you've done a great job. Um, as Rose has said, Campbellford is is a, a larger urban center, certainly, even though um, Workworth and Hastings provide a lot of services to their residents. Campbellford definitely is a large urban center. It's a town um, by nature and it has issues that are very unique and distinct from others that can't very well be sort of merged over or, or um, handed out to others to take care of. They need, I think they need um, individuals representing them that, that understand, you know, the bridge issues or the, the sewer water issues and and the sort of things that perhaps uh, the more rural ar areas um, aren't being as challenged. Um, Percy is fortunate to have a very unique north-south orientation. When you get to a certain part, there's kind of a watershed area. Um, and I think that, that Campbellford itself is sort of in the middle of a lot of things all around it that make it have that standalone identity. Um, and I also think that splitting the town in two, uh, even if a portion, either portion does have a rural component to it, um, odds are that given the population and that there could be two individuals who are elected who are from Campbellford. And once again, we have that sense from the smaller areas that, oh, well, Campbellford has two voices speaking for it. Uh, because the, um, the one, uh, I forget which ward it is, the one ward that's partially, that's connected with the Seymour and um, the east side of Campbellford, should the, um, the elected official come from that corner and someone from across the bridge and the other side represent the other side of Seymour and out to the west, uh, you've still got two voices from Campbellford and we're back into that same little perception of a bit of a power struggle of who who's got the most voices and so on. Um, I think keeping um, Campbellford on its own also give the rural areas the opportunity to elect a rural representative 
or a representative who is, you know, either from the farm community or from the um, from the areas of settlement along the river, Trent River, down around um, um, Healy Falls, Percy Boom, up in those areas where they don't have the population per se to compete with the voters out of Campbellford, but certainly have the opportunity now to elect someone with um, who is more focused on some of their interests and some of their concerns. And I think for me that that makes it a lot more fair. They uh, many times I've seen them throw their shoulders up or their hands up and just say, what's the point? Campbellford's got all the voters. How are we going to get a representative from there? And I think that also speaks to some of the perceptions about how things have been in the past. So for me, when I look at it, I, I like the, uh, the first option. And um, I'll also say I did sit through the two virtual sessions just to get a sense of what people were saying. I wish there had been more, but I think my sense was that um, it was just to make things appear to be fair and, um, and to give people the opportunity to um, continue with their own areas of interest. And, uh, and I believe that uh, also having the mayor and the deputy mayor is also going to give them the additional opportunity to have their say uh, with their representatives on council. Thanks, Kathy. Anyone else? Uh, Dr. Williams? You're muted. Yeah, if I just may add, uh, in picking up on the point uh, from Councillor Metcalf, some municipalities actually have a, a policy, have adopted a policy which calls for a review after a, a certain period of time, let's say after three elections, and it just becomes a, a kind of a standard practice so that it, it, it is brought forward as a matter of routine. I know <laughs> routine 10 years apart doesn't seem like routine, but but it means that it doesn't become a contentious question of, oh, do we have to do this or whatever? You simply say, let's see whether we need to. Uh, and, and anyway, I just leave that with it's more work for the clerk, perhaps he might not like me saying that. But, but the point is, it becomes simply a routine part of your operation that you step back and look at this on some kind of predetermined basis. So a policy of that sort uh, might not be a, a bad idea. Thank you. Um, yeah, I, I, um, um, I think everybody's had a, a shot here. I'm just going to say, I, um, oh, Ken, go ahead. I'm sorry, I didn't, I didn't see your hand. Go ahead. Yeah, I, I just want to say that uh, I think the results of this are very good. Uh, the things that I was interested in is one, we've retained a ward system. Two, the deputy mayor is elected, which I feel uh, gives all the voters in Trent Hills uh, more say in the person on council and looking at the Ward 3 and whether to split uh, Campbellford or not. Uh, one hand, I, I like the numbers game where it's balanced out, but looking at the fact that I definitely think that, that Campbellford should be one ward because I don't like the idea of creating an art, kind of an artificial boundary between the east and the west side. So um, I kind of think that option one is uh, a very good result of this study. Thank you. Now, okay, so I am... Um... Gene, do you want? Did you want to speak, Gene? I can't. Yes, Bob. Uh, in my past uh, time in, as a school board trustee and and as on council, I've always developed the uh, sense of operation that you represent the whole board or you represent the whole municipality, and not your own fiefdom. So it it isn't a big thing with me. I I I think I concur with option number one. It's keeping a town of Camelford together and other councillors have made the good point of some of the history, the bad history that's happened in town and hopefully when the bridge is built we'll be tied together rather than divided and uh, and the farming communities kind of stand alone in their own communities and so I think for those reasons I'd uh, support option one but uh, the basis of it my feeling is that it does not matter what ward you live in, you are a board member or a councillor for the whole municipality. Thanks, Gene. Yeah, I, I, um, I, I agree wholeheartedly. I, uh, and I, I, I'm very pleased with um, uh, the, the work that's been done by uh, Watson and Associates. Uh, quite truthfully, 
when I started, I was pretty whole, whole hum. I think my meeting with uh, Dr. Williams and, and Jack, I, uh, I was kind of, um, uh, maybe flippant would be a good word about the whole situation. But a, as we progressed, I, I realized that um, um, it made sense to, to, um, to do what we're doing. And um, I agree wholeheartedly um, uh, with everything that's been said by the councillors. And, 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 and as Rose and, and Jean so uh, aptly said, you know, we're elected to re represent the, the residents of Trent Hills. Um, it, and it doesn't um, matter which, um, I mean, which ward you're in. And, and, it, and I see it especially as right now as mayor. I, I mean, I get phone calls from all corners of the... Uh, uh, municipality and and um, I don't ask where anybody lives. I mean they they definitely usually tell me, but but uh, so I, I think that that, um, uh, that on a whole. But and I think what this does too with the with the uh, the system we're looking at now, it gives all all um, uh, electors a chance to have a voice in in three of the positions of council, and um, I think that in itself. Um, gives people um, more voice and uh, a feeling of um, uh, of um, involvement. I think so. I'm I'm quite pleased with it, and I I, I would agree that uh, to me <clears throat> the first option, although um, it's a little skewed in in numbers, um, it is probably the best one to to start with. And and as uh, uh, both Jack and Dr. Williams say, I mean, somewhere down the road, if someone feels that uh, uh, we're not being uh, fair or represented uh, well, then, um, then then we can revisit the situation. So if, um, if everybody has um, uh, had their say, uh, I can uh, go to the resolution. Um, and at, at some point here, uh, I will need someone to uh, step forward and give an option of one or two. Um, so, um, just, um, um, Doug, do you want me to uh, have someone make the motion and then then read the whole motion? Um, Your Worship, based on the comments received from Council, it sounds like the consensus is option one. So, if you just want to read the motion with option one and if we get a mover and seconder we'll move forward from there that's great thank you okay <clears throat> be it resolved that information presented by uh jack amandola watson associates economists limited and dr robert williams re the ward uh, boundary and council composition review final report september 2020 be received that commencing with the municipal election of in 2022 the municipality be divided into five wards as set, set out in option one of the ward boundary and council composition review final report dated September 2020. And that the appropriate bylaws to implement the ward boundary and council composition review decisions be brought forward for council's consideration. And could I get a mover and seconder, please? I'd be happy to move that. Moved by Jean. Seconded by Ken. Any more discussion? Mike? Um, is there any way that we could uh, talk about the policy that to put into place for a review? I would suggest every 12 years. I don't know whether that's at this point in time or Doug, whether that's something that we can discuss at another point. Your, uh, through your worship, um, what we can do is the clerk can take that as direction if that is the will of council and include that in the bylaws that come forward for the uh, restructure. Um, the, as they indicated, there will be two bylaws, so we can build it right in that a review be conducted after every three elections, if that's the will of council. Kathy? Yeah, I, I would agree that that is something that should be included in there. Um, it just prevents the sort of thing we've just gone through and uh, gives the uh, gives our electors the, the reassurance that we're paying attention to what we're doing. Thank you. Rose? Um, 
Just the wording, Doug, do we want to say 12 years or three elections? Because um, we know like our election years have been changed and who knows, they might be changed again. Um, I would suggest going with elections. Okay. Um, that way, if they change, and there's nothing to prevent uh, council from choosing to do it earlier if they wanted to. So if by some fluke, um, the province decided that municipal elections would be for an eight year period, well, that's a little long. So <laughs> yeah, we would definitely look at shortening that up. Okay. So we, that would, would be included in uh, as we move on, Mike, is that fine with you? Yes. Thank you. So um, again, I, um, we have a mover and a seconder. Uh, any further discussion? Would you call the vote, please, Doug? Councillor Bratney? Yes. Deputy Mayor Kelleher McLennan? Yes. Councillor Metcalf? Yes. Councillor Redden? Yes. Councillor Tully? Yes. Mayor Craig? Yes. Carried by six, Your Worship, and I will include that uh, reference to reviewing after three elections in the draft bylaws that are brought forward for Council. Thank you. Um, and I, I would like to take another moment to thank uh, uh, Jack and, and uh, Dr. Williams. Um, you know, Watson and Associates have done, a, an, I think, an awesome job. And uh, to your credit, um, we've come through this as, as united as, uh, uh, as when we started. So I, I, I appreciate that. So thank you very much. I appreciate the kind words. And it was a real joy to work with, with uh, your staff and, and all of you. So thanks very much. Thank you as well. Very important project. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Okay. Have a good meeting. Thank you. Take care. Okay, we are now uh, reports from municipal officers. Uh, report um, Rec 2020-2003, uh, reopening of municipal arenas. Um, do we want to uh, have a discussion before we um, make a motion on this or? Lynn? Um, sure, um, three Ms. Ryan, P Peter can uh, jump in. Yeah. Essentially this report um, lays out the various options available um, currently. So our arenas remain closed. Um, the options available to council are to open um, both one or the other or to remain as we are for the time being. Um, given the interest that there, are, there has been from the local user groups, so we have um, included there a table from Camelford Minor Hockey and Workworth, Camelford Figure Skating, as well as Camelford Rebels. Um, they are interested in starting their season. Um, based on the uh, work that um, Peter and staff have done, it is possible, we think, to accommodate the users in um, one facility only uh, for the time being. Um, of course, everything at this point is, is subject to change, and um, but that's sort of where we are at this, at this time. Um, Peter, maybe you want to um, jump here and talk about, I guess, some of the options available specifically and the, the costs associated with each that could uh, potentially influence Council's decision. Thank you, Lynn. Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor. Um, the report outlines three scenarios, um, and we looked at the financial and the staffing impact of, of each one. Um, and a lot of consultation with neighboring municipalities in the county and outside the county. Um, and everyone is watching very closely and what every other municipality is going to be doing. Um, some facilities to the south along the 401 corridor have already started to open. Um, but none up here in the northern part of the county or in our neighboring municipalities at this point. Um, with, with the restrictions from COVID um, in that the increased amount of cleaning uh, and disinfection in between each group, uh, ensuring social distancing and, uh, and so on, um, it results in a reduction of the amount of rentable hours in the facilities um, in order to have the building vacated, disinfected, and then open for the next group to come in and use. Um, so that results in uh, the need for more staffing. Um, so the options looked at that um, 
currently we historically rather we operate with one uh, shift operator per shift unless there's a game um, and basically that'll be doubled so we'll need two people um, to be able to clean and do the duties uh, safely in order to have the, the, the building ready for the next group to come in. Uh, so as a result of that, we basically we have a 50% reduction almost in the amount of rentable uh, prime time hours, which is what we're talking about for the most part here. Uh, pretty much all of our users only use the ice during prime time uh, hours, which is from four to uh, basically 10 o'clock. Uh, 11 o'clock uh, weekdays and then all day Saturday and Sunday. The, um, so the first option um, is, is if council uh, is so inclined to open both arenas, um, there's a, a, an, an additional financial impact um, to, to the operation of those facilities. Um, but we would have the most available ice to rent uh, to the users. Uh, and when we're talking about users at this point, we're really only talking about the main ice users. So um, that is Camelford Minor Hockey, the Rebels, uh, Percy Minor Hockey, and uh, Figure Skating Group. Uh, the Curling Club in Warkworth, or the Curling Group in Warkworth, is, uh, has cancelled their season. So we will not be, if, if Warkworth does open at some time, uh, we won't be painting uh, the ice for curling lines, nor will we lose that time for rental to other users, um, which is a significant savings. Just painting the ice for curling is about $3,500 um, just to put the curling lines painted on there. Um, so essentially, in order to cover the cost of, of operating the facil any facility this year, any arena, an additional uh, uh, incremental cost of about $85,000 is estimated per arena. Uh, so if one arena was to open, whether it was Campbellford or Workworth, at this time it would an, an additional amount of $85,000 would be required to cover the operation for the season. Um, and uh, subsequently in option one, it would just be that times two. So, uh, and that's under the assumption that they're open for the same amount of time, which in reality, uh, it would be a staggered opening like we do every year if both arenas were to open um, at some point. Uh, and option three would be keeping the arenas closed for the season um, and, uh, and just moving forward from there. Uh, so those are the three options that staff investigated and are presenting through this report. Um, and uh, if there's any questions, um, we'd gladly answer them. Thanks, Peter, very much. Um, anyone have any questions? Kathy? Um, this one's more pertaining, <laughs> strangely enough, to revenue, but uh, I was given to understand that we had put forward the uh, uh, a change to the fees and that we were raising our ICE rental fees. Is that just... Is that fact or, or what are, where do they stand in terms of costs to the public? Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, um, no, that, that was not a statement made by the municipality. Uh, that was a statement that was made by a minor hockey group. That is not true. Um, okay. Our fees were set with our fees bylaw last year um, and staff have not presented uh, a report to council uh, recommending an increase or a decrease to those fees at this point. That may have been the Tim Horton, the Tim Horton's council that uh, yeah. did those. I, I, I think it does need to be corrected, though. Thank you. Yes, it does, for sure. Uh, Michael. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, as of today, uh, Peter, have we received, uh, since their support's been written, any return to play plans from any of these user groups? Uh, through your worship, uh, we've received uh, one from Campbellford Minor Hockey that we uh, um, politely, politely asked for them to revise. Um, and they sent uh, another one back this morning just before the meeting, which we haven't reviewed. Um, the, uh, the, 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 the procedure for uh, reopening the arenas that was presented to council previously have, has been revised. Its final edition is here. Following this meeting, we will be sending that out to the user groups uh, after it gets reviewed this week by uh, health and safety. So I would imagine then yet again, the return to play plans would have to be revised, but 
to answer your question, we have one draft from Campbell for Minor Hockey. That's all that's been received at this time. Okay. Um, with the increment or incremental costs, can and I can't remember. Remind me if I we've already spoke of this. Can the staff, the increasing in staff, be covered by that provincial safe restart program? Is that part of the COVID? Uh, uh, expenses that can be used for that provincial funding? I can, I can speak to that. Um, yes, it is. Um, it's uh, the municipality received $440,000 and that is for those incremental operating costs that are a direct result of um, COVID and any changes that need to be made to our operations. So certainly additional staffing for this purpose would fall under that. So that, that would be the plan for that additional amount. If I may add um, through you, uh, Mr. Mayor, moving forward, I believe that this, this pandemic has forever changed the way that facilities and public facilities will operate. It may not be the same as it is now, but um, I would expect there would be an increase even after this funding uh, would be used uh, to help cover this year that there would be an increase uh, in, in staffing levels to ensure facilities moving forward are, are safe and, and cleaned properly. Um, so although this year it might be covered, uh, it might not be the, to the same extent, but I would expect in the future budgets uh, the, that uh, council could expect an increase um, in the request for operating the recreation facilities. Thanks, Peter. Anyone else? Bob? Yes. I'd just like to get a little clarification on, you've heard all the stories about only going to be three on three hockey, et cetera, in small groups. Well, that would make me suggest that there's going to be more opportunities to rent ice if you had the same number of kids that wanted to play hockey. I don't know how, how is minor hockey going to be organized as we know it? into leagues or is this just going to be like glorified pickup hockey? Peter? Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, for, for what I can answer, I can't speak exactly how the structure is going to be through minor hockey um, or the OMHA specifically, because that's where it comes down uh, to. But uh, essentially the, the province has, has uh, mandated that any league has to be no more than 50 people and they can only play within those 50 people period. Um, and, and even at that, there can be no competitive play until after at least two weeks of an initiation uh, of, of playing without any physical contact and how that's going to take place. Um, so it will not be a normal year, period. Um, you know, a league, if, if uh, uh, an age group is, has more than 50 people in it, that has to be divided up. Uh, and they can't play from um, you know, like Napanee can't play Campbellford at this point. That's not permitted. So, um, you know, it's, it's essentially from what we can in, interpret through OMHA and Hockey Canada's guidelines that it's, it, it's kind of training uh, with some, uh, I guess the closest comparison would be kind of house league. Uh, there's no rep that kind of thing, uh, hockey amongst a small group of people in each group. Um, mm -hmm. So it, it definitely will be different. Uh, having said that, if I can add, we, do, we don't have a final confirmation from any user group of the amount of, the actual amount of ice or the registration at this time. So uh, both minor hockey groups have just started to collect <coughs> deposits um, for registration. Um, so they don't have their final numbers either at this point. Thank you. Uh, Kathy? Yeah, I, I guess that, that was going to be a question I was going to ask Peter as well, is uh, what our expected numbers might be uh, on a typical year versus what might be this year. Because I understand also, or maybe they will come back, but there are a number of players that are also going off to other centers or our tournament play or, or other types of play. And, and I <laughs> Marmara has ice in, but Tweed is hoping to open, and I understand Napanee has done some stuff, um, that there are players going off to other centers, and will they come back, or will they 
be able to play other places. It seems to me that um, while we're trying to restrict travel for safety, that there are kids that are mixing and mingling all over the place. Um, and that may be a different issue, but, but how many would we normally have um, in a regular year and, and what at this point might be your expectations, even just of the numbers coming in? For you, Mr. Mayor, uh, I can't speak to the actual registration numbers for minor hockey. We don't get those reports, so I don't okay. know what their normal registration is. We go by the amount of, of ice that's rented historically, um, which goes off of that, that chart that's in the report there. Um, okay. You know, so right now, Campbellford Minor Hockey, uh, we, we, we sent out an email um, uh, about three weeks ago or a month ago asking for confirmation of ice time so we can try to present council with the information um, to make a decision today. Uh, and essentially the, the response was Campbellford Minor Hockey says they'll use the same ice as they did last year, um, where the other groups were, were less. So um, minor, uh, Workworth Minor Hockey um, is, is um, forecasting a reduction in ice to eight hours a week, roughly. Um, figure skating uh, just to three hours a week and rebels three hours a week until uh december when they may be able to play again um and uh, uh curling zero so um that that's basically that's how we uh we look at the um some some centers some uh municipalities will not uh open an arena or will not turn the ice uh, plant on until they have a guaranteed 30 hours per week brighton does that uh tweed has just adopted that as well so until they get a confirmation of a guaranteed 30 hours of ice rentals per week, um, they can't justify turning the plant on. So um, okay. uh, that's just some historical information there for you. Rosemary? Um, do we have to make this decision today? <clears throat> Can we postpone it for a little while? Or do you have to have an answer today, Peter? Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, well, I guess that's at the discretion of council. Um, you know, there is some some planning that needs to take place. Um, there's supplies that need to be purchased that we have been holding off on purchasing, um, just because you know if 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 one, two, or no arena is open, we don't want to spend the money unnecessarily. So um, and staffing, uh, if we have to try to staff up uh further that does take time there's over a month of leeway there uh, needed to be able to to acquire new staff so um, it, it is timely if we are going to try to open any arenas uh, but again that's uh that's a council uh, at council's discretion at this point um, i just i really question if um if our time i i realize i realize all that and i and i just I question right now if our timing is is right with um, with the increased cases that are taking place across the province. Um, I don't think that we are on an island by ourselves, and I, I just question that uh, if our numbers start to increase here in our municipality in our communities, whether we would even have. Uh, or be able to, or should we be organizing these type of events? So um, mm -hmm. that's my that's my big concern right now. Uh, Lynn, sorry, go ahead, Lynn. Thank you, through you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I, I understand what you're saying completely. Um, I do think though, um, everything at this point is subject to change and we do want to be fairly nimble without, you know, outlaying too many resources. Um, Certainly, if a decision is made today, um, if we can get sort of an idea as to where council is going, be it one arena or both um, in particular, so that plans can start. Um, if that decision is made today, it does not mean that we're turning the ice plan on tomorrow. Um, the target date, I think we'll have to work with the user groups in particular to see when they're ready to go. At this point, I don't know that it would necessarily even make sense to rush to put ice in because as Peter said, I'm not sure that any of the user groups are ready to start immediately anyway. So that will be the next decision once we determine which facility, both facilities, no facilities open, um, then we'll put our heads to 
when would it make sense to open? And as Peter said, there's some preliminary work that would need to be done if we need to staff up, um, those types of things. But realistically, and Peter can provide more information, I think we were targeting starting the ice plan at the end of the month with a view to having ice ready in October at either or both facilities. Um, so a lot can happen in a couple of weeks, as you know, during a pandemic with school back in, et cetera. We're all sort of watching it very closely and we'll be ready to react. And, and my second thought, my last thought, it was that if we don't, if we don't have ice, we don't have our arenas open. Um, I know last year the foundation was approached for funding to look at snowshoes for the schools, for the kids to get out in the wintertime, utilize the trails and fairs as park. And I, and I thought, why, you know, if we don't open the arenas, why not look at something like that, snowshoes and cross country skis for the kids to utilize our parks? It was just, just a thought. I am really concerned about uh, the second wave. Um, that's, that's my biggest concern. So. Michael? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I, I hear Rosemary's sentiments. Um, I would have liked to see the user groups have a little more information for us, seeing as they're pushing uh, before August for us to have information for them. Uh, so it, it's a little bit, to me, a little bit challenging uh, to make that decision when they don't know what really they want uh, as far as ice time. At this point in time, I'm prepared to make the motion to open the work, uh, work towards opening the Workworth Arena uh, as a single facility for now. And at some point, maybe we can look at uh, bringing Campbellford back on, but we don't have enough information from the user groups to know exactly how much um, they're using. And I'd like to see their, their uh, return to play policies um, in place to make sure that they uh, have a plan to go back to what Rosemary said, uh, you know, about controlling um, how they're going to use the facility. At that, at uh, this point, that's my uh, that would be my uh, decision, and I'm I'm happy to put a motion forward to open the uh, work towards opening the Workworth Arena. And like Lynn say, everything's very fairly fluid right now, and it's day by day, and we have to watch to to see how it goes. But if we're going to open, we need to have a few weeks to um, get prepared for that. So that would be uh, a motion that I'm happy to put on the floor right now. Okay. Um, just uh, in, in front of that too, I I, um, uh, I know we've heard from Rick, although Rick's not here and Rick does um, um, favor one arena for now. Um, and the one thing I, I, I'd like to bring forth is should we be looking at restricting the use of our arena if we open one arena to um, Trent Hills? Um, with, with what the added costs are, um, you know, uh, it's nice to be in business, but if you every hour you open, you lose money, it uh, really doesn't make a lot of sense to me. And um, so uh, to me, um, we, we should look at uh, restricting the use of the arena to um, uh, Trent Hills sports uh, groups um, because um, A, we will only have one arena, so it will be taxed by, uh, hopefully, you know, by our user groups. But um, um, I just don't think that we want to staff up double um, to uh, put ourselves in position of uh, accommodating different areas. Michael, and then Ken. Yeah, just going by uh, the report and, and the chart there that Peter has, it appears that uh, if we're opening one arena, that we're only going to have the user groups, uh, the Campbellford Minor Hockey, Workworth Minor Hockey, Campbellford Figure, and uh, the Campbellford Rebels to even be able to use that facility. So I, I don't believe there's a, even any room for outside user groups at this point in time if we just go with one facility. Okay, thanks, Michael. Ken? Yes, just to further to Councillor Metcalf, I was going to second that motion, which I believe is option two, to open one arena. At this point, it's a Workworth Arena, and 
by seconding that motion, I guess we can have some more discussion on uh, making a decision. But also, I think we do need to make a decision, one, for staff to plan, and two, also for the user groups. At least they know what we they have, arena, or what's available to them to make plans around. So this is kind of like the school board going back to school, and I think we need to put put something out there that people know and uh, then they can build their plans around. And yes, I understand today that there's three COVID in Campbellford and uh, nobody knows where we're going forward, but I, I think we do need to make a decision on, on an arena. Thank you. Kathy? Um, I just have a question for, for Peter um, and I'm looking at option two. I do agree that we should open only one arena. Um, I think that financially, that's the only thing we can do. Um, the work with Arena is newer, has the ability to open earlier, make ice earlier, and uh, easier to clean. But um, in terms of its size and being able to facilitate a greater number of people, um, by moving to Warkworth, um, are we putting some restrictions on some of these groups where they're going to have now um, move away some of their numbers in terms of registration. And I'm thinking of the rebels as well, if there is an opportunity for them to play or is, is that gonna make a difference where we go? And I guess I do have to make the point that um, three out of the four user groups will be traveling from Campbellford down to Warkworth, which is not a distance, but it's just a point that needs to be made. Thank you, Kathy. Through you, uh, Mr. Mayor. Yes, um, the fact that, that Warkworth is in better repair than Campbellford, uh, it's cleaner, brighter, um, it's easier to clean. Uh, that, is, that is something that is a, a factor. Um, it's also very important to acknowledge that the majority of the users that we would be catering to at this time are from Campbellford. Um, the, the Campbellford Arena has many challenges, but one of its positives is that it has more dressing rooms. Essentially with the Rebels room, there's seven dressing rooms there, where in Workworth there's only two or four, two each. Um, and I, I say that because with the new social distancing uh, guidelines, a dressing room that used to be able to hold essentially a team can now only hold about six people. Um, so each rental will, uh, each team would have, would have to have two dressing rooms. Um, or each group would have to have two dressing rooms. Um, so the potential to, to um, have a slightly uh, quicker turnaround may be in Campbellford um, because staff could essentially have uh, you know, um, you know, two dressing rooms clean and locked and ready to go for the next group um, and open the doors and allow them in and then, uh, then clean the other ones. Where in Warkworth, uh, essentially, uh, the dressing rooms would be uh, cleaned and turned over at each rental, which it's only a minor thing, but it is, there is more available dressing rooms in Campbellford than there is Warkworth. Um, I, uh, the, the Warkworth Arena is, um, uh, we can put ice in there a lot faster than Campbellford. So in the last, this would have been the third year, I believe, that we wouldn't even have started Campbellford until sometime in October, where uh, normally Workworth, we turn the plant on the day the fair ends in Workworth. Right. So um, we are able to turn, uh, uh, make ice a lot quicker uh, in Campbellford, or in uh, Workworth rather than Campbellford. Great, Kathy? Uh, yeah, just to follow up, I, I, I really want to echo, um, Rosemary's concerns. And I think our, our, our biggest concerns this year, even though it's important to get the ice in and important to get, you know, things going, I think we need to be very, very cautious in terms of, of how we do this. And, and I guess having asked some other questions about this um, at another time, I, I want to deal with whatever arena is the, is the, provides the most opportunity for distancing, for cleaning, mm -hmm. and for separation of, of the players. Um, and, uh, and I guess the, the final comment is that we need to be able to make a decision on a dime to close things down if necessary, that we need to have staff have that ability because uh, health is the most important and uh, what's taking place in the larger centers is only going to come here. 
Gene, do you, do you have something? Yes, I, Bob, I want to get into this discussion. Uh, I guess I, I can support one arena. I'm having difficulty supporting the one that's been proposed. Uh, there's been no discussion about uh, high school hockey starting after uh, Christmas break. Uh, historically, the teams have always practiced before school in the mornings. And that would lead me to think that if that was happening, that would be the opportune time to do that in Camelford. Uh, having just been revealed that we got two positive cases of young people in our own locale right now today is is concerning that uh, and the numbers in the province going over to 300. Uh, maybe we're talking about something that's not going to happen. Uh, I've had this thought in a long time. We've talked about putting 12 kids or on the ice in, a, in an arena 60 by 180, but I'm drawing 50 kids in a small school bus and the powers that be seem to think that's all right. Somewhere in the long, in that discussion, it doesn't balance out. But uh, I guess I, I wouldn't think that there's a need to put ice in any place until at least the 1st of November. Rebels are hoping to start 1st of December, so that gives them a month to practice and gives minor hockey, and it pushes back the time to put ice in warm weather. Maybe we won't get any warm weather this fall. We had it all summer, but um, it certainly is easier to make ice in November than it is in September. So, so that's my comment for the moment. Thanks, Gene. Yeah. I but you know, one of the things that I, that that I have had thoughts on on this is is it looks like the province might um, select areas to close down, um, and and um, and I don't think we're one of them uh, at, at this time with our with the numbers. But my concern is uh, if the same as the summer, um, if they close things down. Uh, in, in Durham, or they close things down in, you know, Toronto. Um, those people are coming this way, and I, 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 I have my concerns about uh, about the arenas, um, and I, and I again wonder, um, do we, if it's only going to be pick up on rep hockey, and not rep hockey, um, then 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 maybe we should um, be looking at. Uh, um, making some decisions where, uh, you know, like as Gene said, maybe we look at November the 1st as, as a, a date we could start at and, and let's, um, you know, uh, figure out what we have to do between now and then. Um, but uh, it, it's, um, uh, it's, I mean, I know the user groups want to get going, but I, I don't think, um, the way things are set up right now. And, and, and as Peter said, we, we really don't have other than the one we received this morning, we don't have any, any plans from user groups. So um, I, I, maybe we're putting the cart before the horse here. Ken? You're muted, Ken. Uh, can you hear me now? Yep. Yeah, yeah. Okay, I, I would kind of support a November 1st opening uh, so we get a better tr idea what's going on because I think all of us want it to be as safe as environment as possible. So certainly November 1st would be a date I agree. Rose? Um, yeah, I agree as well that uh, push back the opening. Um, I do believe though that the extra space in the Camelford Arena is the one that should be opened. Um, we know from the experts that it's the, the masking, the sanitization, and the, and the space that is the three most important things to try to keep everybody safe and still carry on with life in some sort of normality. So if there's, if there's more space in the Camelford Arena, I think that that's the arena that we should be looking at putting the money into to reopen at this time. Okay. Uh, Mike, did you have something? Um, yeah, so 
I, I, I believe that uh, I, I'm still going with Warkworth on this one. Uh, November 1st is fine for me. I, like I said earlier, I don't, we haven't really received any return to play plans from any of the user groups. Um, with the ease of, of cleaning and uh, from the Warkworth facility, that's, that's where my opinion is. And I don't see how we can't be two meters apart in an arena. Okay, anyone else? We, we do have a motion. Well, we've had someone make a motion and uh, it's been seconded. Um, do, um, I, I'm, I'm at to the point now where I, I'm not sure that we, um, I don't think it's gonna make a difference. The, that decision right now, it might change in the next month, but uh, we have do have a motion and um, Doug, would you, would you call a question? Your Worship, just so that we're clear for everybody that's watching, it's to receive Peter's report and that only the Warkworth Arena be prepared to open for the 2021 season. And that was moved by Councillor Metcalf and seconded by Councillor Tully. And we wouldn't open until November the 1st. Be prepared to open for no earlier than November the 1st. First, I have adjusted that into the motion, sir. Councillor Metcalf. Yes. Councillor Radden. No. Councillor Tully. Yes. Councillor Bratney. No. Deputy Mayor Kelleher McLennan. No. Mayor Crate. It's either defeated or tied. What happens in a tie? A, a tie is a defeat, Your Worship. Well, so it's not a majority, so it 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 falls to a defeated. So it, it doesn't really matter, other than the fact that um, my thought my th thoughts were that um, uh, I I thought Camelford was the one we should open, but. Um, I guess that doesn't make a, I mean, I, I would at least put my thoughts on, on record, but uh, uh, I guess it doesn't make any difference at this time because the def uh, decision would be defeated. I I'd, I'd still um, need no. your decision for the minutes. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> you don't get off that easy. <laughs> okay, so I said no. A no, okay. So then is there a secondary motion that uh, would alter that and that it is the Campbellford Arena be prepared to open for the 2021 season no earlier than November 1st. I would make that motion. Uh -huh. Seconded by Rose. Okay. Uh, Councillor Bratney. Yes. Deputy Mayor Kelleher McLennan. Yes. Councillor Metcalf. No. Councillor Redden. Yes. Councillor Tully. No. Mayor Crate. Yes. Carried by four, Your Worship. Thank you. Maybe, you know, and then we'll see what happens. I mean, see what happens in the next month. I mean, all this could be uh, yeah. uh, with the way things are, are progressing at the moment. Okay, we have uh, updates for members of council. Kathy, would you like to start? Um, sure. Okay. Um, just wanted to make everyone aware that our libraries, Workworth and uh, Campbellford, are now um, open on limited hours for individuals to attend them and actually select books. It's being very well monitored. Um, and the, um, the pickups uh, are also still happening at uh, Hastings, Workworth and Campbellford. And you can find all the dates and times and whatever online. But there are a lot of people very happy that um, they can make selections. And we are also making provisions during that time. Staff are making provisions for individuals to be able, who are in a compromised situation, to be able to set um, an appointment and actually go in and be safe, uh, feel that they're safe about it. 
Um, we also welcomed uh, two new members to our library board at our first meeting at the beginning of this month. And uh, we're having our, our governance meeting next week and, um, and getting them um, orientated around what's taking place, some orientation work uh, to the board, which is difficult to do um, when we're doing it at, at this kind of a meeting, but I, I think they'll catch on very quickly. Um, just um, also working with the Crow Valley on uh, s following up on issues from this summer. And they've had a great response from individuals around Callahan Rapids, which is not far from Marmara, where they've stepped forward the community as a group. And uh, this past weekend and the weekend before, actually uh, as a group met the visitors to the park uh, that drove in and handed out flyers and they're taking an aggressive stand against people that are using the um, area inappropriately. And uh, it seems to be going well. Um, I also want to make note of the blood donor clinic. Carrie Petherick has sent out some reminders, but I'm not sure that the information has gone out, which will shortly, that this blood donor clinic on the 28th of September is in honor of Taylor Jeffs, who passed away earlier this year. It is, um, I believe, uh, recognition of childhood cancer month and uh, they are taking appointments and they will be promoting um, the support that um, her family and her friends in the community can give by donating, donating blood. Um, the other thing I wanted to just say is that I watched the firemen last night along the river with the pumper and the hose and um, they were doing some training, I believe there's seems to be a lot of training that's taken place. Um, stood on one side of the river and watched them almost give us a car wash. Not quite. They were at the boat launch, but um, there's a lot of power in that spray. And um, they were doing an excellent job. And a lot of people were watching with interest to see what they're doing. But um, I think we have an excellent group that are sticking to their training. I noticed uh, an article on uh, that uh, Sue Dickens had published not long ago. And I think people are paying a lot of attention to the, to the hard work that those volunteers do. Thanks. That's it for me. Are you there, Ken? You're not coming through. Can you hear me now? Yep, I can hear you now. Oh, everything has been fairly quiet and uh, all the committees and groups uh, meetings have been either moved or postponed. So uh, we've been dealing with some uh, issues with uh, constituents and other than that, it's uh, trying to stay safe. That's great. Thanks, Ken. Uh, Gene? Uh, similar to Ken, uh, Lower Trent did have a in-house board meeting uh, just last Thursday and uh, we were distantly appropriately seated in the room. And that was the first time we've done that. Uh, staff is continuing to work at home, but they're bringing more staff in all the time. It's been a very busy summer with the crowds that have come to the conservation parks and stuff and the additional issues of cleaning up and preserving the, the sites as we'd like to keep them be. Uh, We've got a PSB meeting coming up next uh, week or so. And I guess that's a kind of a state of affairs. Uh, buses are returning and, and that's a challenge to keep the right opinion of that. So we hope for the best. Thanks, Gene. Michael? Yeah, I've had, uh, I'm just gonna bring it so council knows several communications with the county regarding uh, the pedestrian crossing and Hastings bridge uh, and after much negotiations, including the option of using a municipal crossing guard, it seemed quite a struggle uh, to find a solution to cross pedestrians, mainly school children across a 20 foot span. Uh, the county advised the municipality uh, on uh, Tuesday, September 8th, I think everyone received that email from uh, Aaron Kelsey that, and I quote, we are having a paid officer, duty officer on site to help cross the kids in the morning and evening. The officer will be there four hours in the morning and four hours in the evening. 
And then on Friday, September 11th, I learned through the media that, and I quote again, the bridge will be open to pedestrians from 8.15 a.m. to 8.50 a.m. and again from 3 p.m. to 3.30 p.m. each day. So in between that time, I had been telling constituents that we will have a paid officer because this is what the county let the municipality know in the morning and for four hours and in the evening for four hours. So we found out online from a media source at 5 p.m. on Friday before the bridge closure. And so I sent an email out and Bob was unaware, Lynn was unaware, and it wasn't until yesterday when the closure began that the county informed us that the county road supervisor would cross the kids in the morning and at night. And I'm just, I, I, I don't know how to express my frustration with the lack of communication and how it changes so often and they don't tell us what's going on. We're like, seems like we're the distant stepsister that no one wants to talk to. I, I'm, I just can't understand it. I'm trying to tell constituents what they're asking me. I'm getting information from the county, directly from the county, and then by the time I tell people what's going on, they've already changed the way that they're doing it. I, beyond, I don't know. No words. And I've uh, had a couple emails about speeding concerns. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Michael. Uh, Rose? You, uh, you're starting to sound like uh, Councillor Redden did a few years ago with the county. <laughs> Um, so uh, Kathy's already filled you in on the, the library uh, board meeting. Um, we did have a BIA meeting last night and uh, the board is looking at uh, getting ready for the fall and the Christmas season and doing some decorating downtown and uh, got a couple of options that they're uh, going to be, uh, Kira's going to be talking to staff about to see if it's, if it's possible. Um, and they're also looking at, of course, the radio advertising for the area and the different programs that way. Um, and that is, uh, that's, that's it. Other than a whole pile of emails and calls from constituents, as I know you guys are all dealing with as well. So. Thanks, Rose. Um, uh, I, I echo Mike's concerns and I, and, and I, um, I've taken them forward a couple of times to uh to the county and um i will take them forward again i i i find it very frustrating to um as mike says to find out through the media um a contradiction to what we've been told is going to happen as far as um the the um the not just the bridge there's other things and i and, I, and i'm um um you know I've been talking to staff down there and I, I, I will, um, maybe, maybe they haven't heard me, but I can assure you that they will. Um, it, it is, is, I mean, I, I just think we should be kept in the loop and I, and, it, and it, it's frustrating to, to, uh, to get these um, updates that come through the media. Uh, and, and, uh, you know, it's like, oh, well, we forgot to tell you. Well, that's not good enough. So I, I, I will carry that forward. Uh, on the speeding thing, <clears throat> I have, I had talks last week with the uh, traffic sergeant in, uh, in Coburg, uh, who assured me that they would be upping their patrols in our school areas. Um, and um, so hopefully, hopefully that's happening. Um, there has been a fair bit going on um, uh, at the uh, at the county, and um, uh, I've been busy with um, with the board of health, um, but um, um, it is uh, it is a different time, and um, uh, hopefully we um, uh, we can convince people that um, they should um, be paying close attention to what our health officials say, so that we can keep ourselves safe out here. So that's um, my um, remarks for today. Uh, before we go to the consent agenda, can, uh, 
I'd like to take a small five minute break. So um, I will see you in five minutes. Your Worship, I will pause the recording. Thank you. While we break, but I'll leave the live stream on. Fine, we'll just five minutes. Okay. Thank you. Start the recording. Um, and if the deputy could follow up with Mr. Peters following the meeting. Okay. We are recording again, sir, so we're good to go. Rose? Uh, no, I'm fine. Well, I'll, I'll go see Jim. I'll talk to Jim in the office. Thank okay, you. Thanks. Carry on. Okay. So we'll continue on with the consent agenda. <clears throat> um, we have... Um, Autonomy Conservation Watershed News from September 2020. We have the minutes of the Eastern Ontario Trails Alliance meeting held on August the 13th, 2020. And we have the minutes of the Trent Hills Public Library Board meeting held on June 4th and 15th, 2020. We resolved the staff recommendations with respect to consent agendas 10A to 10C be adopted as printed. Can I get a mover and seconder for that, please? Moved by oh, Mike. With a question. Yeah. And seconded by Ken. Michael. Thank you, Your Worship. I'm, uh, my question is uh, the e EOTA report. It, in the minutes, it says the financials. Cindy advised the board that uh, the EOTA is doing really well. Um, the, suggest the chair suggested starting a reserve. Yet, uh, I don't know if the rest of council is aware, there's uh, bridges, you cannot pass that trail between Hastings and Campbellford due to bridges that are out. Um, and unless that has been rectified in the very short term, is there any funds do we know of that are being used for this maintenance before we consider a, they consider a reserve fund? I don't know if anyone, I, I don't have that information, but when I saw that they suggested a reserve because they're doing well, but they still have trails that are unpassable between Hastings and Campbellford. Um, I think Mike, we have to, would have to, uh, uh, Rick's not here and Rick is our rep on the EOTA. Um, so, but we will, um, we will get that question answered for you. Um, and I agree if, um, if, if our trail is unpassable, um, they shouldn't be putting money away and, uh, not um, maintaining the trail. So we'll get an answer. Thank you. Okay, just a sec while I make a... Okay, we have a, any other questions on that? Call a question, please, Doug. Councillor Metcalf. Yes. Councillor Redden. Yes. Councillor Tully? Yes. Councillor Bratney? Yes. Deputy Mayor Kelleher McLennan? Yes. Mayor Crate? Yes. Carried by six, Your Worship. Thank you. Uh, we're now at uh, communications and petitions. So we have correspondence. Uh, proclamation of October is Child Abuse Prevention Month. It resolved that the correspondence dated September the 9th, 2020 from Tam Callahan, Executive Director, I'm sorry, Tammy Callahan, Executive Director, Highland Shores, Shores Children's Aid, re proclamation of October as Child Abuse Prevention Month be received. That per policy POL.ADM.007 proclamations, October be proclaimed as Child Abuse Prevention Month and posted on the municipal website that the request to tie purple ribbons to the downtown area of Camelford, Hastings and work in October in recognition of Child Abuse Prevention Month be approved and that the applicant be advised of council's decision under the mayor's signature. I have a mover and seconder for that, please. Rose and Kathy, any discussion? Would you call a question, please, Doug? Deputy Mayor Kelleher McLennan? Yes. Councillor Metcalf? Yes. Councillor Redden? Yes. Councillor Tully? Yes. Councillor Bratney? Yes. Mayor Crate? Yes. Carried by six, Your Worship. Thank you. Uh, we have correspondence rehabilitation of Camelford Dam 11 request for exemption from the noise bylaw for night work. 
Um, I'll read the resolution and then I think we have some information from Ty. Um, be resolved that correspondence dated September the 4th, 2020 from Nihad Terzad, project, project manager, surgical re rehabilitation of Camelford Dam 11, request for exemption from the noise bylaw for night work be received. Then an exemption for night work for Camelford Dam 11 from 2100, 9, 9 p.m. to uh, 2 a.m. from September 17th, 2020 to October the 15th, 2020, in accordance with section 14 of the Trent Hills no noise bylaw be approved or denied. That with, notwithstanding the September 17th, 2020 date, night works are only permitted to commence following council's granting of an exemption and surgical providing hand delivered notices to those properties within the immediate, immediately adjacent to the 255 meter radius line noted in their request. That a subsequent request for an exemption from the noise bylaw for night work may be considered for the phase 1C work for sluice number 4A following a review of the level of success obtained during September 17th to October 15th, 2020 exemption, and that the applicant be advised of council's decision under the director of legislative services clerk signature. Um, if we have a mover and seconder, and then we can have some discussion. Moved by Ken. Seconded by Kathy. Discussion. Um, Jim, uh, do you want to? Uh, uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, I believe Ty has been dealing with the company and has made a site visit, so he might have some information to report to Council. That's great. Thanks. Ty? Uh, yes. Good morning, Your Worship and, and, uh, and Council members. I wanted to let you know that I did attend the property this morning um, with, with Nihad, and we did a complete thorough site inspection. Um, I can attest to, you know, having experience with this last year, there have been some extensive uh, sound mitigation measures taken. Um, I don't foresee this being uh, as big a problem as what we dealt with last year. Um, I did uh, also speak to her and, and advise that they should be making uh, uh, hand deliveries to all residents within the proximity of the, of the work being done. Um, she is more than willing to do that. She's also brought in a decimeter and said that we will respond collectively with any response, with any complaint that is brought forth, they will immediately address and look to have resolved within the 24 hour period. They've done things to make sure that we don't have some of the ongoing complaints that we did receive last year should not happen at all this year. Um, I, I'm comfortable with what, with the, with the sound mitigation measures, having done site inspections, um, the sound, the, the sound levels are more than manageable. Uh, we were standing having a conversation, not having to elevate our voices or raise our voices right beside the equipment being used at the time. I think we should foresee this not being a big issue going forward. Thanks, Ty. Any questions? Kathy? Um, I'm just looking at the uh, items 0.7 in the report under 7.1 mitigation measures, and there's some strikeouts and then some changes edits in the red. Did we um, do we do those edits, or or did they initiate them themselves? Because I, I I like the bit about the the timing and so on. Is that something that's happened uh, because of 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 our work? Do you know the answer to that one, Ty? Uh, I I believe so. It's something that uh, we've worked on collectively and collaboratively. Um, as, as dealing with last year's experiences going forward this year, we looked at to let's do everything we can to mitigate this going forward and not be reactive. Let's be a little more proactive. And, and they've been really responsive and receptive. Yeah. I, I just want to say that I like the way it reads rather than giving them 24 hour notice. They're actually, we're spelling out the, the specific times yes. so that they know what they can and can't expect. And I think the more specific we can be, even though it makes it difficult, I think that's better for the residents. Michael? Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, also on 7.1 uh, mitigation measures, I'm assuming that this document will also relate to the municipality of Trent Hills and not the municipality of Trent Lakes noise bylaw of 2005 and 06. <laughs> Newly noted. <laughs> 
Yes. Uh, I, I I also kind of question the 2 a.m. Uh, I mean, I'd be happy to go till midnight, but uh, Ty, if you, I, I, if we've reduced the period from the ask to just one month, we can go with try the 2 a.m. But uh, I'd be much more comfortable with a, a, a 12 a.m. exemption. Um, just my point on that. Thank you. Okay, uh, Gene, do you want? It's I'm going to support the motion as it stands, but just be aware that if they come back on the 15th of October and want an extension and the results have not been satisfactory, I will not be supporting a, a second extension. Given that, that is a huge project going on there. I just boggles the mind how much uh, rock work that's been done and continues to be done and can fully understand where the $20 million budget was struck. Okay. Um, all in. Doug, you call the question, please. Your Worship, just so I can confirm, the motion we have on the floor is to approve the... Yes. Okay. Councillor Tully? Yes. Councillor Bratney? Yes. Deputy Mayor Kelleher McLennan? Yes. Councillor Metcalf? Yes, with concern. Councillor Redden? Yes. Mayor Crate? Yes. Carried by six, Your Worship. Thank you. Uh, we have no bylaws, no notice of motion, so, um, no closed session. So we are now at the confirmation bylaw, which is be resolved at bylaw number 2020-076, a bylaw to confirm the proceedings of the council meeting held on Tuesday, September the 15th, 2020, be read a first, second, and third time passed and properly signed and sealed by the clerk and mayor. Could I get a mover and seconder, please? I'll move. Moved by Rose. Second. Second by Kathy. Call the vote, please, Doug. Deputy Mayor Kelleher McLennan? Yes. Councillor Metcalf? Yes. Councillor Redden? Yes. Councillor Tully? Yes. Councillor Bratney? Yes. Mayor Crate? Yes. Carried by six, Your Worship. Thank you. Um, I'm not sure how we'll handle this next one because it's be resolved that we now adjourn at 11.20 and Rick's not here to move that, so. I've been asked to handle that. Uh, oh, have you? Oh, good. <laughs> moved by uh, Ken. Uh, seconded by Gene. Gene. And uh, we'll call the vote. Councillor Tully. Yes. Councillor Bratney. Yes. Deputy Mayor Kelleher McLennan. Yes. Councillor Metcalf. Yes. Councillor Redden. Yes. Mayor Crate. Yes. Carried by six, Your Worship. Uh, yes. Give me a moment. I will stop the live stream and I will stop the recording. All right.